Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Sorry I'm just a minute or so late there. The countdown ended. I came out of the back after praying with the guys and realized I'd forgotten to get the microphone. And so I uh, had to do that because there's not a way for me to, there's not a break for me to go get it. So apologize, especially if you're online and you thought, what are they doing? So uh, uh, we're here, okay? We're here and we're excited. So just a few things just to make mention of. There's a, a yellow card out on the tables that you, can, uh, that you can pick up. It's for an event that we're going to have the end of February. You're like, well, why are you talking to us about it now? Because we need some help. It's a super spring spectacular. It's going to be a carnival type uh, deal for, for kids for, uh, from within the church, without the church. Uh, we're going to make up games and put them out there. And so you can sign up for that and let us know that you'll be there to help. But for those of you that want to say, I want to help build some of these, or maybe you have an idea that you want to add, we'd love for you to let us know, and then we'll get that to you, okay? A couple other things just to make sure. On the bulletin, if you haven't picked one up, you might want to. There's a new number in there for a prayer line. You can call any time during the day or night and leave a prayer request. We're going to be utilizing that in our monthly prayer times, and so uh, you make sure that you uh, grab that number and put it in your phone so that when something comes up, you can always call the office, you can always call one of us, but if you want to make sure that we get it and we can have it uh, for use uh, when we have our prayer times, grab the, grab the bulletin and get that number off of it in anticipation of that going forward, okay? Uh, next Sunday, right after service, we'll have a new members class. It'll be re meet right down here in front. If you're wanting to know more about Murdoch or you're wanting to join Murdoch, come to that class. It'll be right after service, right down here in the front. And then also on the 21st, 21st of February, is, um, is our next church conference where we will, uh, it's not a special call conference, it's just we're gonna have one that we will tidy up everything from 2020 and deal with any other business we need. So make sure you have that down. And then also on the 20th, how many of you have a Walk for Life shirt on like I do? Okay, stand up if you got one, okay? Okay. And you're welcome to wear those all, all the way up until the 20th when we, have our, when we have our walk. If you have any questions about the walk, the reason I had these people stand is if you have questions, come talk to one of them. They'll tell you how to participate, whether that's praying, whether that's sponsoring, or whether that's coming and walking. I'll be there. I just don't know how much walking I'll do on that day. I might, I might be cheering you on from the sidelines. So uh, you guys be seated. But just make sure if you, if, you, if you have questions about the walk, just see someone that's wearing a shirt. They'd love to tell you about their experience. And uh, listen, we're a church that believes in the sanctity of life from the womb all the way to the tomb. Okay, uh, and we are about we are about allowing God to be the one. He is the creator of life. He is the giver of life. He is the judge of life, and we believe that God is the one that determines that, not us. And so we want to we we partner with Pregnancy Solutions, especially about those that are in the tomb, those that have been born, those that need support, those that those that need help. And so we we want to do that. Okay, so let's pray, and let's get into our worship this morning. Okay. Father, we thank you. We thank you that, Lord, we can gather corporately to celebrate what, what you have done in our lives individually. And, God, how we've worshipped you all week long. So, Father, we come to sing, to hear testimony, to hear your word. Lord, to, to listen for your spirit moving in our life to teach us how to be more like you and less like us. That's what John the Baptist said. And Lord, that's, that's what we need to do. We need more of you and less of me. So God, help me this morning to hear your spirit from your word speak to my heart. And then God, give me a will that will obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we, uh, 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 a year ago, we wanted to uh, commission uh, Jim Watley. And Jim is up here almost every Sunday behind that camera. You don't hardly see him. But Jim's going to come out here where you can see him this morning. And um, Jim has uh, taken a position at Jesus Loves You last February. And so uh, we were going to do a commissioning shortly after that. But the 
something happened. Um, and, so, and so we've had a difficult, but I, I, I want Jim to be able to express to you, well, I'll give him the microphone right after I ask a question. You know how that is with me, right? I ask questions, he'll say something, I'll have some more questions. He, has, he really has no idea where we're gonna go after he answers the first one. Uh, okay, so, uh, so Jim, uh, you got your friend? Oh, I got one over here too. So, okay. So, so Jim, why don't you tell us, I mean, what do you do at Jesus Loves You and how did you get there? Well, my title is facilities manager. Uh, what I actually do is a little bit of managing the facilities, but uh, pretty much whatever needs to be done. Uh, my main goal is to free Ashley up as much as possible because she has a lot of things that she needs to do, not at the location, but out and amongst the community, uh, get together support for Jesus Loves You, sets up the engagements that we have, like the uh, shoe drive we just went through. We've got uh, the shower now, that uh, the portable shower you saw last Sunday. That is going to be all over the place, and she's setting up the locations for that, putting together the drivers to take it out there the people that'll run it. Uh, she's got a lot to do, so I'm trying to take as much off of her as I can by working wherever I need to be. Okay. Working showers, giving out clothes, serving lunches, whatever needs to be done. Okay. So how did this passion to serve there start and culminate and now your own staff there? Well, it would have started back uh, when I was a little kid. My mother always had a passion for people and uh, always brought the families together. We had a large family out there. She was one of uh, six daughters. And so they were all in California, but one. Every holiday, she got everybody together at our house, had cookouts, and it just kind of rubbed off. My dad was a firefighter and uh, I went into the police force after I got out of the military. And it was always trying to help people somehow, some way, especially in law enforcement. You never got to meet the good people when they were up. The good people you met was always just be, been the victim of something, no matter whether it was a car wreck, a robbery, a house invasion, whatever. And you just trying to get them and bring them back up to where they were. And uh, it, it carried over down here. Uh, Darlene started working at Jesus Loves You. She had time, I didn't, I was still working at Walmart. And when I finally got my Wednesdays off, I started going in and volunteering on Wednesdays in the shower ministry. And that uh, went on for a few years. And then uh, Jeff Burns came up to me and he had a proposal for me. And he had been talking with Ashley. And uh, I'm gonna call it a Christian coincidence, what I call it, it's a God thing. They, <laughs> they had uh, known that Ashley was gonna need some help. And they were looking for somebody that they thought would be able to do that. And Jeff said, well, I got a name. And Ashley says, well, I got a name too. And it turned out to be my name, both of them. <laughs> so that kind of... That kind of put me in a spot, because <laughs> I had not been thinking about that at all. So then it became my turn to do the prayer thing. And through a lot of prayer, and just trying to listen to God, I said, yeah, okay. And it worked out to, to be great. I mean, it's gonna be a year next month. And it, like I said, the COVID kind of changed things and what we were aiming to do but uh, like everything else, you have to adapt. So we've been adapting, sometimes on an hourly basis, sometimes on a minute to minute basis. But still, as long as you step back and say, God, this is your ministry, it's not ours. We're only able to do what you allow us to do, what you give us the knowledge to do. So that's as long as we keep it in his hands, it's, it'll be doing fine. And uh, I would like to just thank everybody here now that I got a chance and a microphone. I haven't been up on a stage in a long time. 
other than behind a camera. But everybody out here, I want to say thank you. Because without you folks, we wouldn't have Jesus Loves You Ministry. You are the ones who come in every first Sunday of the week, of the month, and bring in items that go into our store to get donated. Our major volunteer group is right out here. You're all our volunteers working in the store, working in the shower ministries, and hopefully Sundays will come back again where we can do it on Sundays. But we can't do it without the help of the people. And you are God's people, and we thank you and just ask you to help us do God's work. So we're going to pray over you in just a minute. But if you had one or two things that you said, and, and not, not in regards to just Jim, because we're talking about Jesus loves you in particular, but that you said that are at the forefront of when you pray about Jesus loves you, that you'd want this church to be praying in concert with you about. What would those one or two things be? Well, the first thing would be that every camper that comes through that door at our Jesus Loves You facility, they get a chance to hear the Word of God and to know that they are sinners and that they need Jesus. Just like every volunteer that comes in up there is a sinner saved by grace. We want the campers to know that and that they too can receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and work for him then. As other, we've had people come through there that are now back volunteering. So it's, uh, it's a good cycle to get into. The second one would be get them out of the woods. We'd like to see everybody have a roof over their head, not a piece of canvas or a piece of tarp. And in the last couple of months, I think we put, and I will we'll say we, it's going to be the royal we. The staff up there has put about 16 to 18 people into housing in the last couple months. Now, some of the places that they get to go into are not going to be the Taj Mahal, but it's going to have a bathroom, it's going to have a shower, they're going to have beds, they're going to have a roof over their head, actually a door they can open and close to go in. It's going to be much better than the tent that they have and their favorite tree in the wood. So we just thank God for that, that he's able to get the finances put together, the people that will know the grants and stuff that need to be had so that we can put people out of the woods. We would like to work ourselves out of a job by getting all the homeless into homes. Uh, it's a goal to shoot for, and with God's help, that's what we'll do. So as we, go ahead. So as we pray for Jim, as we commission him, normally we would be here at front and we'd invite you all to come and gather around him and everything. Uh, we just can't do that. So here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. If you will not just pray for him this morning, but if you would continue to pray for him uh, just on an ongoing basis, just simply saying, God, give him the strength, give him the wisdom, uh, give him the compassion, give him the patience, uh, all, all that he needs to accomplish what you have called him to do. If you would, if that's, what you, if that's where your heart is, that you would pray for him. I'm going to invite you to stand so he can see you standing. And you can reach hand, your hand out towards him if you want. You don't have to. Uh, some people aren't comfortable with that. You can if you want. But I want us just to pray for you. Uh, Father, we come before you. And Lord, uh, you know, there's a lot of times we see in Scripture where you call people out. Uh, Lord, we've just, we've been reading in our chronological study where you called Abraham out to go to a new country. Uh, God, we see in Acts where the church, uh, you told the church to call out Paul and Barnabas and go on a missionary trip. And Lord, they, they laid hands on them, they commissioned them, and they sent them. So Father, we do the same today. Father, you have called Jim out uh, to do ministry. And it's not always the easiest of ministries. And it's not always the most encouraging of ministries. But, Father, it's a very needful ministry. And, Father, we need men and women who have his kind of, his kind of soft heart, compassion, desire, energy, 
And so, Father, we lift him up before you saying, God, thank you for calling him out. Thank you for his faithfulness to go. And God, continue to use him. You have heard his words. You've heard his prayers. You've heard the desires of his heart. And there are more, Father, than beyond this. And so, Father, we come alongside him and we say, God, will you help him as he works with those that Jesus loves you to help people get out of the woods? And God, will you help him and those that serve there to make sure, first of all, that they know you as their Savior? And then all those that come through the door to also hear, also hear about the saving and the saving work of Christ that is theirs if they will but turn to you and trust you. Father, thank you. Pray that you bless Jim, bless Darlene, bless the ministry of, of Jesus Loves You. As, Father, it, it is not just simply about a cup of cold water, but Father, it is literally a cup of cold water in and with Jesus' name. Father, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And so um, one, of the, one of the areas where we are able to do ministry because of the faithfulness of your stewardship, as Jim said, of people but also finances and bringing things, is uh, it, that, that faithfulness allows us to be involved with Jesus Loves You, and they're involved with us. I mean, uh, uh, those 36 turkeys that came that we got rid of in, 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 in about a week all came because of our partnership with Jesus Loves You. Uh, that shower trailer that was here last week that's going to go out, that some of you are going to go alongside, some of you are going to help move it, some of you are going to help work it, and you're going to be able to talk to people. That came because of a partnership with Jesus Loves You, and, and yet there's so many other things that we partner with, so many other things that we do, but it's always to share the love and the message of Christ. And that's the reason we do it. And so I thank you for being a church that supports the, the, with your tithes, with your offering, with your, with your energy, with your time, with your skills, the opportunity for us to share Jesus with other people. Let's pray and just ask God to bless our faithfulness. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you that, Lord, you have called us. And as you have called us, Lord, we have been faithful. Father, as, as a people, as we are given provisions, as we're giving talents, as we're given time, Father, our people have been faithful to pour that in to ministry around the area. Father, not just so we feel good about that we've done something good, but, Lord, that the name of Jesus is lifted up that people might be drawn to you and that their lives might be changed forever. Thank you for the faithfulness of the giving of the people of Murdoch Baptist Church. Lord, may, you, may, may we not rest on our past faithfulness. May we continue to do that into the future. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we're going to, uh, let me get my glasses out so I can see, otherwise I won't be able to read. We're going to begin a series this week, uh, this Sunday, that's going to go, uh, we'll finish it uh, the first Sunday in March, okay? It's going to last that long. And, uh, and it, well, let me just ask this, how many of you have been on a cruise? My gracious. Now, since I, since I have come to Murdoch, I have, when I first got here, one of the first things that I heard from people is, you need to take Amy on a cruise. Anybody agree with that? Okay. Now, now, here's the thing. And when I ask people, why should, I, why should I go on a cruise? Here's what I hear. Because it's unending food. Like, I need unending food. <laughs> they say it's very relaxing. And I'm like, okay, but I can relax pretty well at my house. And then they say this one. They say, yeah, but there's no cell phones, no texts, no emails. Oh, now you're starting to tempt me, okay? Right, am, 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 I, am, I, am I pretty correct? I mean, that, that's where some of you would say those are the things. Okay, so uh, we've got, uh, there's a cruise liner. Yeah, we'll bring him up there, there's a cruise liner. Anybody been, I mean, that, that, anybody want to take a trip? Yeah. Okay, now, now when we look at these cruise liners, then we talk about all the food, and, I, and I'm, yeah, yeah. Like that would get me in lots of trouble. Anybody else? Yeah. 
Uh, somebody told me they went on like a, I forget what kind of, how long the cruise was. They said they came back, they would gained like seven pounds. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Uh, and, and then they talk about the, about the housing, about, about your accommodations. And they just say they're, you know, especially if you can get where you can see outside and, and you're, not, you're not too far down. And it's just gorgeous. Anybody, anybody want to sign up? Just a few of you want to sign up to go? <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to, want anybody, anybody else want to talk to the person next to you to make sure that they don't want to go, you know, okay. So here's the thing. That looks all fun, doesn't it? Yes. You know, for, for most people, it looks, it looks great. For some people, they're like, on the water? Are you kidding me? No, give me the mountains. But here's the problem, okay, is the fact that the, the, these, some of the same ships that are cruise liners, like the Queen Mary. Now, you may not know this, but the Queen Mary during World War II was refitted and was made into a troop carrier. And the food then looked like this. All of a sudden, the dining room's a little bit different. And the housing arrangements, oh boy, I hope you like the people that you stay with. <laughs> yeah. You see, here's the thing, when, when you compare, uh, the, the, when you compare what, what was in World War II with where things are today, I, there's probably not many of us that would sign up for those black and white photos, are there? Nope. We're, not, we're not really wanting that, are we? we, 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 we when we compare them side by side, we sort of want the one on the left, right? I mean, look at, look at how cramped that is on that, on that right side. And, and when, when we talk about the food, well, I'm sorry, the, the housing, there, there, there's the food, and there's the housing. <laughs> when we compare those, we simply say, wow, there's a stark contrast. And I would say that most of us today, in fact, I, I venture to say all of us today, would only be in for the colored pictures, not the black and white pictures. But can I tell you, my friends, this series we're going to do, this passage we're going to look at, says we're on a wartime footing. We ought to be on a wartime footing. We ought to recognize that in our lives as believers in Christ, we are in a wartime footing. And that's where we should have been from the day that we came into relationship with Christ until today. But I would tell you that the church in America has been weak because we have lived in the color pictures rather than the black and white pictures. Because we, have, because we have not been on a war footing, because we have not been concerned about the thing. Now, somebody's going to say, wait a second, I am concerned about the things of God. Listen, when we read this passage, I want you to understand, when we're concerned about the things of God, it's not just about showing up at church. It's not just showing up and, and, and bringing a tithe. It's not about coming to a Sunday school class. It's about how you live your life every single moment of every single day for the glory of God. And so if you have your Bibles and you're able to, I invite you to stand with me. Let's read Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Therefore, gird up, having girded up your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. My friends, we're at war. And we should have and we should realize that. 
We have been in a war with light and dark. From the moment you confessed Christ and he saved you, you've been at war. You have been. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us to remember this world, the world system that's under the control of Satan, all these spiritual forces, they are not our friend. But Father, you do not leave us bereft. You don't leave us alone. You don't leave us unarmed. You don't leave us unprotected. God, when, when you say, oh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Father, so many of us have been strong in so many other things, and we've trusted so many other things for, for the might to be able to overcome the things that come in life. Instead of you, help us. Help us to realize that we are called to serve you. And because we've been called to serve you, Father, you give us everything we need. In Jesus' name, amen. So we get to this verse, uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 10 through 18. And, and it would be remiss of me not to do what I always encourage you to do, is to understand why it is Paul reaches this application or this point of action at the end without understanding what, all, what else is all in Ephesians. Now here's the thing, I'm not going to read to you the entire book of, of Ephesians. But I am going to just trust you to, that you will take, if you've not read recently, that you'll take and you'll read uh, what it says. Um, but here's, here's the thing. The book of Ephesians tells you this, that we are the sons and daughters of God, and he has given us everything that we need in order to, to be pleasing sons and daughters of God and also to accomplish his purposes for his glory. Now, for me, when I read through the book of Ephesians, you come immediately to chapter 3. Just turn over a couple chapters there. Chapter 3, verse 20. We're going to read three verses here, and I think you'll see this culminating right here. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant, man, exceedingly abundant. That sounds like redundant. Now, he's saying it's going to just keep overflowing. It's just not going to stop, okay? Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. What's that power that works in us? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit works in us. He says, exceedingly abundant, everything we ask and everything we think. God wants to change how we think, and when we're thinking about the things that are for God and how to bring glory to God and how to live for God, he says, I'm going to give you all the power that you need to do just that. To him, verse 21, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. What are you called to be? You're called to be a son, and a, a son or a daughter of God. He says you've been called to do that. You've been called to live as the children of God, and so therefore live accordingly that way. Live worthy of that calling. Live up to that. How are you going to do it? By the power that's in you. By surrendering to the Holy Spirit that's within you, you can accomplish all that God has for you. Everything that God wants to change in your life, everything that God wants to do through your life, he has given you the power in you to accomplish all that. You don't have to figure it out for yourself. Now, as we look, as we go back to Ephesians 6, as we go back to Ephesians 6, we, we, need, to rem we need to understand, first of all, okay, we're going to jump down to verse 12 for just a minute. We need to understand, pick up the last couple words of verse 11, that stand against the wiles or the scheming, the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is not a sermon series, and this passage is not about standing against the culture, first and foremost. It means first and foremost, you stand where God tells you to stand and how God tells you to stand, and you stand in holiness. 
Now listen, that, that, that doesn't mean that there's not evil things in the world that's not going to come against us. Well, I'll tell you, if, you're not, if you won't stand up against the things that are coming through your mind and your heart, you'll fall for anything that comes from the world to begin with. Okay? The battle starts right here. Battle doesn't start out there. Battle starts right here. And he says, listen, I want you to recognize that what you're fighting against is not people out there. And listen, in our, divisive, in our divisive culture at the moment, we want to fight us and them or us and them and them and them and them and them and them, okay? I, I, that doesn't matter however many thems you got out there. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about spiritual forces of wickedness in high places that want to destroy you. They don't want you to succeed in living for Christ. They want you to fall. And I just want you to hear me say this. If you, this, this, this series really is going to, we're going to talk to those, that are, those of you that don't know Jesus. But this is really a series for those that, that know Jesus. Just going to be, front, be very honest on the front end. If, you have, if, you, if you've professed Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you're in a battle. Whether you recognize it or not, whether you want to ignore it or not, whether you want to say, well, it's not a big deal or not, you're in a battle. And if you don't have the, if you're not standing in the power in, in, of the Lord and the power of his might and, in the, and, and strong in the Lord, you are defeated already. Doesn't mean you lose your salvation. Just means you're pretty miserable spiritually. That's what it means. Listen, whether you want it or not, whether you signed up for it or not, whether you, whether you have any inclination to it or not, you have a foe. And he doesn't care if you want to ignore him. He's still coming after you if you're a believer in Christ. And his name is Satan. He is, with all of his minions, they, he wants to destroy you. This is what it says over in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for prey. And the prey he's looking for are those who claim Christ. All the other ones, he's already got them. But if you claim Christ, if you follow Christ, if you say, I'm a believer, you got a foe. You got a foe. Now, here's the, here's the thing. I want, you, I, I, want you to, uh, I want you to understand verse 9. Resist him is what, is, what Paul, is what Peter says. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Listen, the stunt, things that come against you, the temptations that you have, the, the, all those things. Listen, <clears throat> everybody has those. You want to successfully, successfully live for the Lord in spite of them? then you do it the way God says it. If you try to do it any other way, you've already failed. You're already defeated because you cannot stand on your own against the schemes of the devil. You just can't. You see, I, listen, Satan doesn't always come at us head on. It's like that lion. He's, he's, listen, he's slinking around. And when all of a sudden he wants to let you know he's out there, then he'll roar. But normally lions don't just creep up on you. Lions just don't run up to you and grab you. They, they sneak up on you because they want it to be a quick attack. He doesn't come head on. He, he comes subtly. He comes convert, uh, 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 you know, covertly. And listen, we're going to stumble and we're going to fall at times. The attack is going to happen and it happens because we were not attentive. Be sober, be vigilant. Be ready. Be prepared. And sometimes it happens because we're complacent. We're complacent because we just think, well, I, you know, I, I'm in this Christian bubble. I'm immune. I, I li you know, my parents are Christians. I'm immune. I'm telling you, teenagers, this, this stuff is just as much for you as it is for the person that's, that's 95 years old in here that's been following Jesus for 75 years. If you're a believer, you have an adversary. Doesn't matter. 
Sometimes it's because we think we're immune. Sometimes it's, it's because we just simply say, well, you know, it, it, it's not important for me to, to stand for the truth right here. And I just want you to know, when you, when, when you all of a sudden won't stand for God's truth here, you've already taken one step down the hill and you're already starting to slide down and the speed just picks up. And there's other people that just want to say, you know, I just don't want to stand up. I just don't want to cause any waves. I just don't want to rock the boat. I just want you to know, <laughs> Satan says, good, you're easy prey because he's coming to get you. The, the, the verses here say, put on the whole armor of God. And that, that, that phraseology there, put on the whole armor of God, literally means put it on once and for all. That doesn't mean you don't need to check it. Make sure, you know, make sure that you're, that you're keeping it on. But it, it, he says, put it on once and for all. Uh, now, why do you put it on once and for all? Well, because if you turn over to Jude, in Jude 24, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Put on the armor of God because then God can keep you from stumbling. Now, anybody in here like the Marvel Universe? You like all the, all the superheroes? Anybody into that stuff? Okay, I'm not going to ask who your favorite character is because if you're in the Marvel, Mar even if you're not in the Marvel Universe, you've definitely seen commercials for Iron Man. Okay? If you've watched the Iron Man movies, you know that Tony Stark, he's the guy that wears the armor and he becomes Armor Man, I I Iron Man. Okay? And as you watch the movies, as, as you get into movies two, three, and the other ones, all the other ones, all of a sudden he has different ways of getting the armor. Uh, there's one where he has it in a case. There's one where he has two things on his wrist and he clicks them and, and the armor comes flying at him and it just sort of covers him up and then he's all protected. My friends, do not try to think that God's armor is like Iron Man's. It should be on you all the time. It's not when you want it. It's not when it feels convenient. It's not when you see an attack coming. You wear it all the time. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, and you don't know if he's sneaking up on you. He's after you. He's after you. He says there in the verses, he says, I want you to stand firm. Stand firm against the wiles of the devil. Of the devil. How long do you got to stand? How long do you got to stand? Till he comes. Now that's whether he comes for you or whether that's he comes back in the second coming. Till he comes for you and takes you home because your body stops, stops functioning or until he comes and takes you from this earth directly to heaven. Whichever way it is, you stand firm. You don't give in. You don't go back. You stand firm. The wiles and the schemes of the devil. Why? Because, listen, here's four names that the devil has. He's an accuser of the brethren. You ever felt accused? You ever felt beat up? I mean, he looks at you and he says in your spirit, he looks at you and he says, how in the world can you call yourself a Christian? You ever been there? He's the tempter. Oh, it's just a little bit won't be. It'd be okay. Have you ever heard that? You ever sense that in your spirit? He's your adversary also. Not only that, he's also a slanderer. Listen, when he came to Eve in the garden, he came as that serpent. And he came and he told Eve, he said, Huh, did God really say? Is that really what he meant? Oh, listen, I know that God said, but you won't die. God's a liar. Not only is God a liar, but God's holding out on you because if you'll eat that fruit, then you'll, you'll be like God, knowing the difference between right and wrong. Listen, that's the same package that he puts underneath our bed every single time he wants to tempt us. 
He just puts it in a different bowl with different, puts different paper on, puts a different bowl on, and hands it to you all the time to try to get you. He calls God a liar. He says God, God didn't really mean that. Oh, no, listen, listen, that was for people 2,000 years ago. That was for people 4,000 years ago. That's not how God meant it. That's not true for today. You, you, you've been reading the paper? If you read the paper with a theological understanding of what Satan wants to do, you see his attacks popping up. His schemes are right there, and they're becoming more and more bold. He doesn't have to hide them anymore. Why does he not have to hide them anymore? I'll tell you why he doesn't have to hide them anymore, because Christians have been complacent, inattentive, and unprepared. Because we've sat back. Because the Christian church has been silent. And all of a sudden we say, well, how do we get where we are? Because we did not put on the whole armor of God, standing strong in his power and his might. And we did not stand firm. We did not stand firm when it came to our kids or when it came to, when it came to situations at work, when, when we could stand for God and we could, and we could give a, a reasoned defense, a compassionate defense. All we knew was to say, well, that's not what the Bible says. Now, God wants us to be able to converse with people and engage people and talk about things. He wants us to help lead them to truth, not beat them with truth. It's not what he calls us to do. You see, Satan is crafty. Satan's deceitful. He lies in wait. And some people might say, but listen, it's just me in my house. Why does Satan want me? Why does Satan attack me? Why does Satan, like a roaring lion, seek after me? Why? Because he can't attack God. But he can attack those who are created to be God's image bearers on this earth. And he can destroy what the world thinks about God by destroying us, by taking us down. And all of a sudden, they look at God differently. Isn't that what's taking place today in so many places? And so he says, listen. Realize who your enemy is. Realize what he's doing. Realize that he's after you. Realize how he does it. He baits a hook. Listen, there's, there's passages in Scripture that talk about hooks and snares. It's like when you go, it's when you go fishing. You want to put something on that hook. You cover up the hook and you throw it out. And you hope that, you know, when I, when I was growing, I think I've shared this before. When, we were, when I was growing up, my dad would make these dough balls with cornmeal and molasses and anise, and they stunk to high heaven. I was so thankful that they had some kind of bags back then that they could zip it up that you couldn't smell it. And my mom would take this big old hunk of it, and she'd stick a hook in there, and they'd mold it around, and she'd throw it out there. And she'd catch catfish. I mean, it, I mean catfish and carp. I, 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 I mean, big old things. Why? Because they could, they could sense that. They could smell it. They, and, and the thing is, they didn't realize that when they got that, they got the hook, too. That's what Satan does to you and me. He makes it a tantalizing. Or he puts it in a snare to where there's, there's, there, there, there's something there that, that all of a sudden we step in it and all of a sudden our legs are caught, our arms are caught, our hearts are caught in a snare. And then Satan comes and he gloats over you. And sometimes you feel utterly, utterly helpless. You are overwhelmed, and you just want to give up, right? That's where some of you have been in the past. Maybe that's where you are today. You've gotten trapped. You've gotten hooked. You just want to give up. Just don't see any way out. And yet, Scripture tells us, if you look there in, if you look there in, 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 uh, in Ephesians, he says, if you read the whole book of Ephesians, he says, yes, Satan's a ninja. Satan's going to come. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna make you feel helpless. He's going to drag you down. But what he says is you read through the whole book of, of Ephesians. He says, listen, you're a son and daughter of God. 
God, by his grace, has forgiven you. He set you free. And not only that, in in chapter 1, he says, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've been given a down payment by the Holy Spirit, by God of the Holy Spirit that says, listen, you have heaven in store for you. You don't have to live this way anymore. You don't have to be there. You've been forgiven. The grace of God has been bestowed upon you. And instead of being helpless, and instead of being hopeless, we turn to God. And we say, God, set me free. Set me free. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, verse 15 and 16. How do you do it? Seeing then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He says, listen, we need to make sure that we're walking as God would have us to walk. And when we do fall into sin... When we do stumble, when we do trip up, when we do feel beaten down and we don't know if we, within us, that we can get back up, that's where we have to say is I can't get up on my own. You couldn't save yourself to begin with and you can't deal with the sin you've fallen into now, but God can forgive you. God can restore you. God can lift you up. God can make you walk as he wants you to walk. The, the whole pattern of what Satan wants to do and what God wants to do is contrasted in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the reason he baits hooks. That's the reason he, that's the reason he puts snares out with, with bait in it. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly that you can pass up those hooks and those snares, that when you get trapped in them, that I can can free you, that I can show you how to have life, that you can live differently. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26... And, said, and he's talking about a gentle servant. He's talking, he's talking to Timothy. And he says, this is, how, this is how you need to come, come alongside people. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been captured by him to do his will. He's talking to lost people there. But the Bible also tells us that God is willing to forgive us if we'll confess our sins. And he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So listen, if you're a Christian who has fallen and who just doesn't know if they can get up, doesn't know if they should even try, God says, oh no, I have life for you and I will cleanse you. If right now you're caught by the snare of Satan and you have not ever come to Christ, he says, oh, come so that you can be changed, so that you don't have to live this way anymore. I mean, you got to admit the fact that where you are is the pattern you're living and these hooks and these snares and all these things, it's not how you want to continue to live. You, want, you do want life. He says, if you'll trust me, if you'll repent, turn away from those things and turn to what I have for you and trust me and me alone, I'll forgive you and I'll save you. So whether you're a Christian or a lost person, God offers hope when you think there is nothing left. For he says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Let's look at our verses here in chapter six as we finish up. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's rulers of rulers. He says, listen, those that, those that are over top. And, and listen, I, I just want you to hear me say, some of us go, wow, you know, h- how can you stand against someone that's that powerful? And yet Romans 8 tells us, the end of, there in the end of chapter 8, he says, nothing, nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what principality or power it is. Nothing separates us, if you're a believer, from the love of God. Nothing. In Colossians chapter, chapter 2, verse 15, I just want you to hear this. This is what he said. This is, that, this is after Christ has come and, and, and he's died for us. He says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. 
Listen, Christ triumphs over top of principalities. You want to vote for a winner? You want to live for a winner? Then live for Jesus. Live for Christ. It goes on. Against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Listen, this helps us understand the fact he's not talking about, about, about people that are in political position, whether it's in the Roman Empire, whether it's, whether it's an American, American nation, doesn't matter. He's not talking about people. He's talking about those who come against us, who literally are working behind the scenes to accomplish Satan's purposes. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, those that are working in and among people to accomplish all that Satan wants. He says, listen, that's what we wrestle with. And that word wrestle means to grapple with. It means to struggle with. It means to stand against. It means to, listen, that's, that, that's where we are. How are we supposed to wrestle? Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day having done, and having done all to stand, to stand. You see, so many times we, we, we give in, we, we back up, we, um, we, we don't stand. And he simply says, oh no, listen. God in his power and in his might has given you these pieces of armor. Listen, get the picture. Paul is in chains at this point, chained to a guy with armor on, a centurion probably. And as Paul is writing this, Paul is looking at that physical representation of that centurion and he's writing down these things. And he's not telling you to go buy a gun. He's not telling you to go buy bullets. He's telling you to, to trust in the power of the Lord and, and to live for him. He's not talking about dealing with anything going on politically. He's talking about dealing with what's going on in your heart first. That's where it starts, our hearts. Because if our hearts are off, then our actions will be off. Our reactions will be off. And so as he looks at that guy, he says, listen, I want you to put on the whole armor. Because he's looking, he's looking at that guy and he's seeing the, he's seeing the, the shoes and he's saying, the shoes are important. The belt's important. The breastplate's important. And the helmet's important. He walks right through all those pieces. And we're going to walk through those piece by piece over the following weeks. We're going to look at each one and why each one is important. And why you need to have the whole armor and you need to stand Listen, there, as I said before, there are no leisure pieces in the armor of God. And I looked, and I couldn't find a place where he says, after you get the armor on, go find a rocking chair. Couldn't find it, Terry. I really wanted to. Would have made me feel better. And he says, stand. Why stand? Because when you're stand, when you're standing, you're vigilant. You know something's coming. You know there's something to be watchful for. You're attentive. You don't get caught off guard. You're prepared. And you're able to help others. Listen, I, I, I do. I, I really want you to understand if you don't want, if you're a believer and you don't want to be in the battle, You can try all you want to be a conscientious objector. Uh, you can even try all you want to be a draft dodger. Satan's still going to come get you. And when he does, you'll be alone and you'll be unarmed. Instead, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God and stand. Stand. This is what James says. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So let me just ask you, will you join me? Will you join me as one who says, I'll make sure that my armor is on, that my armor is clean, and that I'm standing. Will you? Can we be a church that will stand? Now listen, we're not talking about taking stands against social stuff. We're talking about we're taking a stand to live for God against what Satan wants to do to tear you down. What Satan wants to do to take you astray. What Satan wants to do to make you follow him, follow, follow his lies and his deceit. Are you willing to take a stand and say, I will stand? Will you do that? Let's pray. So this morning, there might be someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior doesn't know him. And this morning you recognize you've been, you've been trapped and you bit into a, a hunk of something that for a little bit tasted good, but man, it's got a barb in it you can't spit out and it's killing you. Will you turn to Jesus? And it doesn't matter whether you're online or whether you're sitting here. You don't have to talk to me. You don't have to talk to an elder. You don't have to talk to anybody else. You can just talk to the Lord. But I'd like to pray for you. I would. And I'd love to answer any questions you have, especially what it means going forward for you to live for Christ. So this morning, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus, that you say, I need Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him, but I desperately need one. If you're online, if you just write that, I need Jesus in there, We'll have someone reach out to you just to pray with you if you want us to. If you're here, will you raise your hand? You need Jesus today. You've never had a relationship with him ever before. You need Jesus to save you today. For those of us that are believers, We're going to walk through this. Do you see the need to put on the whole armor of God? Do you understand the need to put on the whole armor of God? Will you commit between you and the Lord? I want to stand. Oh, and Lord, I need your armor. I need your strength. I need your might to stand. God, will you do that in my life? If that's the case, just lift up your hand. Say, that's where I want to be. I want to live standing. Standing for the Lord in the power of his might. Father, I pray for, pray for our people, whether they're online or whether they're in person. And God, as we Lord, as we struggle each and every day, Satan puts things before us. Lord, we put things before ourselves, too. Lord, it's not all on him. We can't, can't blame everything that comes happens on Satan. Sometimes we just put ourselves in the place. But, Father, it's because we're believing the lies that he says that it's okay, that we can do this. So, God, help us to recognize his schemes and help us to stand. Help us to trust you. Help us not trust anybody else. And God, for those that say, I want to stand. I want to be, I want to be in the power of God, in the power of his might, in his strength, in his armor, standing for him. Encourage them. Because the attack 
is coming one way or the other. Help them to stand that they might be an encouragement to others and that they might be a witness to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So some of you might say, we're going to do communion. Everyone got your communion cups? Okay, you got your communion cups? So some of you might say, well, Ron, you've been standing between these two things on either side of you, and you've not said anything really about them, either one. Well, let me just encourage you. Uh, I will. We'll talk about them. Uh, uh, anybody seen this guy walking down the street anytime lately? I mean, you don't really see this, do you? I mean, people just don't wear suits of armor like this around anymore, do they? That's the reason we have this suit of armor. Because I'm going to help us as we walk through each piece of the armor of God, we're going to connect it to what that would be in a fireman, firefighter's life. Because you do see these people. And as you see them, hopefully it will help you remember about those different pieces of the armor of God. Just as a recognition that we recognize what they fight against isn't people. They fight against heat and toxic and fumes, toxic fumes and smoke and, and fire. It's not anybody. Listen, it, 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 it's very much, very much like what this passage talks about. And so we'll walk through that, just helping you understand. But uh, I'm very thankful. Brian, Brian uh, found these for us and got them for us, and uh, he takes good care of us, doesn't he? Okay. And yet we know the people that wear armor and people that wear firefighter's gear don't always die in their armor or their firefighter's gear, but their lives do end, right? We know that. And so as we get ready to do communion, I want to read you a passage out of 1 Corinthians. I want to remind you of this passage, okay? I want to remind you about, about this body that we have and the body that we will have to come if we are believers. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Anybody get excited about that? Yeah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on, put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Standing in the armor of God and having done everything, stand is not in vain. That's what he calls us to do. He came and died for us. That's what we celebrate when we take communion. He came and died for us so that those verses could be true in anyone who would trust him. Has it happened in you? If it has, then I invite you to take communion with us. If it hasn't, I invite you to abstain. Why abstain? Because it's not really a celebration you're a part of. You don't really have a part of it. It won't mean anything to you. But for those of us who know him, oh, it means everything to us. It means everything to us because we celebrate what he has done for us, in us, through us, and has in store for us, right? 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when given thanks, he broke it and said, 
Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes till he comes. That's how long we're supposed to stand. That's how long we'll keep celebrating communion, till he comes. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing, and we're going to celebrate what he has done for us. Let me remind you, let me just encourage you. Remember, if you're singing, please have a mask on. That just protects everybody around you. If, you're, if, if you don't have a mask, hum, okay? Let's stand and let's praise the Lord as we sing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him who overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally.
restless alone, faultlessly stand before the throne. Amen. This one, not there we go. Some of you might say, well, I need some more help on how to stand and everything. We've just started this past Wednesday night. Um, it's posted on Facebook every Wednesday afternoon uh, for Wednesday night Bible study. We've just started to study through Second Peter. Second Peter dovetails very, very closely with this passage. And so I encourage you, if you are not already participating uh, with us on Wednesdays, on, on, Wednesdays, uh, on that, uh, join us. Uh, you can pick it up if Wednesday doesn't work for you, pick it up another time. But uh, you, uh, you'll find help for you in this journey of standing firm, standing until he comes in that, pa in that passage as we walk through that, okay? As we close, we're gonna read Acts 4.31 again. Okay, and, and the question for me to ask you is this. There's four things in this passage. Where are you as you leave today? Okay, you ready? We got them up there on the screen. There we go. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. If you've not been to life group, now's the time to go. If you want another life group, other than right after service, there's ones on Monday night, there's also ones at eight o'clock on Sunday too. But find a life group, please, please. You have a blessed week. We will look forward to seeing you throughout the week and then again as we gather for worship next Sunday. You take care. <laughs>